Alright folks, welcome back to the Whitfield Analysis. I am your host, Sam Whitfield, broadcasting live from NGC1 here in Southern Florida. And uh, right now on the uh, line I have uh, Michael Hausen. He has been joining us for the uh, last segment. And uh, Hausen and I have been talking about all sorts of things, and he just gave me his uh, endorsement for uh, Senator... Sanders, even though we all know he's joking. So, uh, how's him? You, you were, uh, boy, I could just feel your endorsement for Bernie Sanders. You're really feeling the burn, aren't you? Uh, no, you know what? Honestly, man, the, the fact that that guy has uh, a platform for more than about 5% of the population blows my mind. Um, here's my thought overall about the, the election. Um, uh, foundational principles. Number one is I am a – my commitment is not to the Republican Party, the Democrat Party, the conservative party or any other party. My commitment is to the principles of freedom and liberty. Uh, that includes social stuff. That includes political stuff. That includes regulatory stuff. That includes economic stuff um, that – I, 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 my goal is and my desire would be to have as little involvement with the state as possible. Okay, number one. Uh, so when people say, okay, you know what, we need to advance the interests of the party, uh, I am a registered Republican because number one, we have a two party system. Uh, anything beyond two parties, the way our political system is set up, is a waste of time and energy. And I think that the better home for my perspective of conservatarian, classical, liberal philosophy is the Republican Party. Um, that being said, I have not yet picked a candidate that I like the most. Um, when the whole thing started way back when, I was really excited about Scott Walker because I thought that a governor would be the ideal opponent to a – Hillary Clinton or Bernie Sanders or um, Joe Biden candidacy. Uh, the idea of an executive that's run a state would have the perfect narrative to say, hey, look, didn't you just elect a legislator for the last eight years? Why don't we try somebody that's actually been an administrator that's run an organization that has experience running a huge political um, administration successfully here in X state, I'm going to take that success and move it to DC. So in that respect, I was really open to Bobby Jindal. I was open to, um, Susanna Martinez. I was open to Nikki Haley, but I was most excited about Scott Walker. Scott Walker's campaign sucked unbelievably. I mean, the guy got absolutely no traction at all, which was disappointing. Um, Politically, I, I, I have a – I think I actually fall more in line with Rand Paul's politics than anybody else that's up there right now. Maybe, I think. Uh, that being said, I would rather have Marco Rubio, Ted Cruz, John Kasich, Jim Gilmore, Chris Christie, Rand Paul, Mike Huckabee, Rick Santorum – Every single day of the week before having Donald Trump be our president. Right. Right. Um, of the people that are I mean, – the reality is right now there's three candidates, Marco, Ted, and Donald. The rest of them, they're just treading water and totally wasting time. Um, I go back and forth between which one I like more, Ted Cruz or Marco Rubio. Um, I think that mm, the – even though I've heard Trey Gowdy talk at length and others at length about what they think of Marco Rubio and what he had to say about immigration stuff, I find it very compelling what they've had to say and also what Marco's had to say. Um, I'm not yet ready to decide between the two of them. I will say this. The one thing I do not want is Donald Trump to be the guy – running for president as the Republican nominee. I mean, that I think would be the worst of all possible worlds. Right. But at the same time, and here's, and here's my, 
my problem. Well, well, Zach has Zach has a question first. I want to get to which is why it, are Cruz fans so weirdly uh, impenetrable? Which I I don't really know. Is that a sexual reference? <laughs> um, <laughs> man. I haven't thought about penetrating anybody from Ted Cruz's. I don't know what he's talking about. <laughs> well, well, uh, well. I I think what Zach means by that is that look, my my issue with Ted Cruz fans, and really this is this is for any sort of candidate. Here's my bigger problem: is at this point, even if the Donald is to be, become the nominee, I will still vote for him. The problem that I have with uh, Cruz's fans and the problems that I have with uh, Rand Paul's fans especially is, and I know that you and I have talked about this on, off air, is these conservatives who are who have latched on to their candidates and they're saying, I'm not going to vote for anyone else even if my guy is not the nominee, I'll just stay home. And I think that's a disaster uh, for us. Yeah. Um, I would say that about every single one of the candidates except for Donald Trump. Here's the thing. Um, I have several good friends that I greatly respect have said there's no way they could cast a ballot for Donald Trump no matter what under any circumstance. I've got others that have said, you know what, at least Donald Trump would not be Hillary Clinton. Right. And probably the best, the best explanation of that, really good friend of mine who is a, a registered independent and he's kind of a libertarian type. Um, he's not registered with the Republican Party because he think the party disgusts him, but he votes mostly Republican, if not always Republican. And here's what he said. He said that he sees no difference between Hillary and Donald, despite what Donald is saying today, that he would change – uh, with a flip of a coin is, is, would not be surprising. But he said this. He goes, look, if Hillary Clinton is the president, everybody, the media, uh, the Democrat Party, moderates in the Republican Party will work as hard as they can to assure that not only is her historic presidency successful, that her historic presidency will be one of the most successful presidencies ever because they don't want to have the first woman president be a failure. And he said that because of that, no matter what kind of insane idea she comes up with, that will get more support than if that same idea were to have been proposed by a President Trump. So he thinks that even though they would be identical – effectively that it's more likely that Hillary Clinton's agenda would be put into practice than a president Donald Trump. And he said, for that reason, not because they're going to be any different in terms of anything, but just in terms of how though, how successful they would be at implementing their agenda that he would prefer a Donald Trump. Cause he's not going to be as successful getting stuff through, which I thought was a pretty interesting uh, idea. Yeah. I, I just, I just find it scary that Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders have gotten this gotten this far. I I feel like, and maybe this this is just me being a little pessimistic, but I I feel almost as if we've become so divided within the conservative movement that everyone is just so stubborn and we can't figure out how to move past, and so that that's why that's why we're stuck with. Uh, Donald Trump. I mean, I, the the whole thing with Donald Trump. I I think Ben Shapiro put it the best on his podcast. Trump is uh, politically incorrect, and that's the only reason why he's doing as well as he is. Um, and I just, I just when I think of Hillary or Bernie entering the White House, I get chills down down my spine. Oh my gosh. I, I to, did, did you watch the Democrat debate, Sam? Uh, no, I, I didn't even know that, de, that the Democrat debate was on. That's how – I mean I, I've missed the last several, but I, I don't even know – I didn't even know that the last one was on. But I heard some of the excerpts from your show. Oh, right. Yeah, I watched that thing and it is 
It is a feek show. Let's just say, I mean, the the idea that there could potentially be a majority of Americans that would want either of those two human beings as the head of the executive branch of the government of the United States of America, as the commander in chief of our armed forces is truly mind boggling to me, Sam. It really is. Yeah. It, it, uh, I mean, it's also, I mean, Hillary Clinton, I, I kind of knew he, I kind of knew she was going to, to be the, the kind of the front runner of the Dems because I mean, she's Hillary Clinton. She's been, part of the Democrat establishment for quite a while, but Bernie Sanders, the fact that he's made it this far, I mean, I I think it was either Ben Shapiro or Gavin McGinnis that said this, but it's basically like, he's basically like your senile great-grandpa who has dementia and doesn't really know what he's saying, and yet he has somehow clawed his way, you know, to the top of the Democrat field, and the fact that there are, are young people who like him far more than Hillary. I just, I just don't understand the appeal with Bernie. Oh, I totally agree with you, man. So, yeah. Although you, I, 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 you know what? I don't want to come on your show and have to correct you. So this is done with all respect that I can possibly muster. And you know how much I care about you. Right. Um, Hillary Clinton is not part of the establishment, as she pointed out the other night. Uh, <laughs> she's a woman, so that would be impossible. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, well, he, well, she, well, well, she's she's a woman, and Bill Clinton is a saint, right? That's exactly uh, right. Yeah. I, what, did you did you hear her uh, explain that triumphantly why she is not establishment? Yeah, I yeah. I, oh. Yeah, I'm like, yeah, you've been working in Washington for uh for the past, you know, 35 40 years. Clearly you're not establishment. So I uh, thought that was one of the funniest things I'd ever heard. Hey, I have a vagina. I couldn't possibly be establishment. I'm like, "Oh my god. I I, I just thought that was one of the funniest things I'd ever heard in my yeah, entire life." Yeah. For- Fortunately, now here's here's the here's the thing. I think that comment backfired on her because anyone who does the least bit of research into her past knows that she's clearly been in, in you know Washington politics for for years. And uh, Dennis Miller on one of his HBO shows, I think, uh, you know, he he once said that uh, she's perfect for uh, to run for. Uh, New York Senate because clearly she's the quintessential New Yorker. Oh, so, totally. So absolutely. Yeah, I I don't know, man. It's just there's a lot of insanity, and I I just hope that we can get a good candidate. And and I hope I'm I'm glad that Trump kind of got taken down a few pegs. But let, let's be honest, it it's going to be between uh, Marco and Ted. I, I sure hope so. And here's the thing is if it comes down to that, um, Marco makes the point that the Hillary Clinton campaign is more afraid of him than they are of Ted Cruz. And, you know, you see all the people that are lining up for Rubio, right? Uh, Tim Scott just came out with for him. Bobby Jindal came out for him. Trey Gowdy has already come out for him. Um, you know, the reality is that Whoever the Republican nominee is, they're going to need establishment support. I mean, the, whoever the Republican nominee is, is going to need to get the most extreme free market libertarian all the way to the most left wing rhino Republican that the, they're, they're all going to need. The, all of those folks are going to need to coalesce behind the Republican leader, and I sure hope it happens, man. Yeah, I completely agree. Hey, man, I want to thank you for uh, coming on the program. We have another guest coming up. But real quick, where can we uh, find you online? Uh, the two best pla- uh, three places. One, houserules.us. That's H-A-U-S, rules.us. Secondly, Twitter, at M-P-House, H-A-U-S. 
And then also Facebook is House Rules with Michael Housem. Between those three things, everything I do flows through one of those three places. Uh, and you have a uh, you have a station list guide on, on your website for those who can't listen That's on, right. online. That's right. If you go to the HouseRules.us site, there's a little thing that says radio show. You click on that and there's a station list. All right, man. Well, I, I I wish you the best of luck, and I've uh, I've really enjoyed uh, listening to your to your radio show again, folks. Uh, you can catch House Rules with Michael House on weekdays, uh, seven p.m. Uh, seven a.m. Excuse me, uh, Pacific ten a.m. Eastern, uh, right here on Spreaker. If you search uh, House Rules, I also believe you have an iPhone app too, which I've been using. And yeah, uh, there's an iPhone app and a Google app, an Android app. Go to the Google store or the Apple store. It's a free app that allows chatting, live listening, and archiving. Yep. Uh, so you can go to all those places. And, uh, Michael, I want to thank you once again for uh, coming on the show. All right. Thanks a lot, Sam. Have a great afternoon, brother. All right. You too. Okay. See you. Bye. Bye. It is always good to uh, listen to uh, Mr. Hausman, hear what he has to say. And now, folks, we have another uh, guest coming on the program, uh, John Stevens, who I am going to call here on Skype right now. Uh, so bear with me here for just a sec. John Stevens, who I am going to call here on Skype right now. Uh, so bear with me here for just a sec. John, are you, are you there? I am here. Hey, John, how are you? Can you uh, Good, Sam? How are you doing today? today? Good. Can can you uh can you turn down your, your uh, audio on the speaker feed real quick? I'm getting some. Uh... You bet. All right, folks. Uh, so. John Stevens is uh, one of the, probably one of the most, uh, well, he's probably, he's probably one of the most genuine people on Facebook that I know. He is also the author of, uh, what is the name of, of your book? The Sissification of America, A 50-Year Decline in American Exceptionalism. And, uh, yeah, yeah. And I haven't read this book yet, but John Stevens is probably just the mo- one of the most insightful people uh, out there. So, uh, John, welcome to the Whitfield Analysis once again, and uh, thank you for coming on the show. Oh, you bet. I'm really glad and happy to be here with you today, Sam. So, uh, John, you and I have been talking a lot off air about the election i i want to ask you real real quick what your book is about first of all because i think it ties a lot into what we've been talking about with the election cycle and, and everything yes sir i began researching and writing the book in 2006 and i uh, self-published it on amazon.com in uh let's say it was september of 2012 it was a six-year sojourn and the reason I began writing it, uh, Sam, for your listeners too, is I was very concerned as a public school teacher and as um, just a regular citizen about the direction our country has been going during the course of the past 50 years. I'm 60 years old now, and I, I just noticed that over the past 50 years, I've seen our country by way of government policies and so forth in decline. And so I did a lot of research on it and writing it, and I wanted to just uh, bring about an awareness, you know, as if a lot of people don't already have that awareness, but nevertheless, putting it in print, the reasons why we're in decline. What has happened uh, since the early 1960s and uh, over the course of the last five decades? Um, If you would like, and if you have time, I could read you a a brief synopsis of it. you know, that's on the back cover, sure. or I could summarize it. This is uh, taken, I believe, from both my introduction and conclusion, but The Sissification of America is a nonfiction narrative which addresses current events within the context of comparing America's vibrant history to its contemporary era. 
The book specifically examines how the federal government and some of our nation's public and private institutions have gradually led the nation down a precipitous 50-year decline of virtues that made America unique in world history. So the intriguing book focuses on American virtues that consist of the following, a spirit of independence and rugged individualism, a thriving work ethic, honesty, capitalism, competition, excellence in education, and a Judeo-Christian rectitude of impeccable character. Now, while these virtues are still evident in America today, they exist to a much lesser degree when compared to the years between 1620 and 1961. So the seven chapters of my book touch upon many topics that correlate directly with these unique American virtues and their declining influence upon society, such as the demise of common sense, the continual assault being waged upon the individual rights and freedoms of all Americans, the squelching of states' rights by the Leviathan federal government, the breakdown of the traditional family unit due to fatherless homes, the feminization of our culture, the feminization of America's public schools, and the feminization of our nation's men and boys. Last but certainly not least, the controversial issues confronting America's public schools and teachers. So that sums it up pretty much. Yeah, I mean, and and I uh, I'm I haven't read the book yet, but I'm I'm about ready to order it on uh, Kindle. But from just from what you and I have uh, been talking about, you have you have a very interesting background as a public school uh, teacher, and uh, which I find to be fascinating. The fact that you're a conservative and you're a public school teacher in uh, in uh, liberal California. Um, so you're kind of at the cultural, uh, you're kind of at the cultural, uh, center of America with, uh, Hollywood in it and everything. Uh, sure. What would you say, uh, how, I, I know you just kind of went, went over it, but if you could just kind of, uh, explain in your question, how do you think we got to the stage in America where liberalism just took over well it's kind of had its strong points and weaker points for example it was weaker under the uh, Reagan administration but I especially in the first chapter called the New England way draw upon how regardless of our political party I bring out the wonderful leadership qualities of two presidents of two opposing parties John F Kennedy um, for the Democrats as well as Ronald Reagan, for the Republicans. And while there obviously have been differences and so forth, in my personal opinion and also based on my research, I believe for the Democrats, John F. Kennedy was the last great Democratic president. And if he were alive today, if you get into uh, and research his speeches, his public appearances, and what he believed in, he would be very much rolling over in his grave if he were to observe what has become of his own political party. And in many ways, he and Ronald Reagan were much alike um, because they believed in guiding their administration uh, through an example of history. And uh, they, they both really revered history and knew the importance of it and passing it on to our children. They referenced both administrations, referenced uh, a city upon a hill that was established by the Puritans when they uh, established the Commonwealth of Massachusetts in Boston, 1630. At the time, they were talking about that particular city as being a beacon of hope and light to the rest of the world, but it also was prophetic in the sense that it would represent our nation. So both Kennedy and Reagan drew upon that and wanted to guide their administrations by certain puritanical examples of honesty, integrity, and really looking out for what is best in the best interest of the country and putting the best interest of the country before party. And it's really interesting, the research, when you go back into it. And when if you, those that get my book, and, and especially when they read the speeches of John F. Kennedy, they are really going to be awakened as to what he believed in. And, and our parties, in many ways, were similar. There wasn't the divisiveness to the degree under his administration. Um, he brought Americans together. 
in the early 1960s, Reagan did the same thing. And, uh, but the 60s, as we all know, were very turbulent. You know, you have the con- counterculture movement, and it, it got progressively, a lot of these people are now um, governing us in Washington, D.C., and so many, it's no surprise that we're getting, you know, basically from the hippie generation, they're now hippies wearing suits. Right. Their philosophies have not changed, you know, for many of them. And I document throughout the seven chapters basically where, um, as a nation, we've been turning our back um, on God. Uh, Christianity no longer has the influence that one once had. And uh, the government has grown so large that it's trampling on individual rights, it's trampling on states' rights, um, and really listing more and more left than ever before. And uh, I wrote about these issues beginning in 2006. I published in 2012, and I look with a certain amount of irony, Sam, when I'm watching various programs, and I'll cite one like uh, Bill O'Reilly on Fox News. He, for the past four years, on Megyn Kelly, too, and Sean Hannity, they've been talking about the various concerns that I published in my book. It's almost like I felt I beat them to the punch, if you will in terms of bringing out what's going on and the dangers and what's going to happen if we don't turn this country around. Right. And uh, that's, that's where we are at this particular point in time, except for our decline is going down much quicker than I even anticipated when I published the book in 2012. And I warn this nation in the conclusion that if we don't turn things around, we are going to be no different than ancient Rome. We will be a failed experiment because uh, if, if we lose sight of who we are, if we don't have a vision for who we are and what we need to do and uh, unite under a common vision and cause, then what happened to ancient Rome is going to happen to us. In fact, there's some really strange and eerie similarities that I could even cite that are quite illuminating when you look at what led to the decline of Rome and what's kind of led to the decline of America, for example. Here is what brought down the Roman Empire, the ancient Roman um, Empire. Political, public office seen as a burden, political unrest with the citizens, social area, a decline in interest in public affairs, low confidence in the empire, disloyalty, lack of patriotism, emphasis on entertainment, isn't that interesting? Education, decrease in general level of education among citizens, that is one of the most frightening things um, that I research and write about since I'm a public school teacher. Economic issues, poor harvest, gold and silver decline in inflation, heavy tax burden, a widening gap between the rich and poor, and finally the military, threat from northern European tribes, low funds for defense, problems with recruitment, and the decline in patriotism and loyalty among some soldiers. You read that's what brought Rome down, ancient Rome, and I see so many parallels in terms of what is occurring in America today. Yeah, it's it's really it, I I heard I heard you uh, you know reading that, and in, in my mind I was just kind of checking off each one of those areas. I'll tell you, it's it's really it, it is really airy if I airy if I do say so myself. You know how. Uh, you know, close we are to ancient Rome. Now, uh, you know, I'm a glass half full guy, as I know, as I know you are. America, America, at this point, I don't think is beyond saving it. And yet, this election is so uh, critical. This is, this is, I believe, and, I, and granted, I'm only 21, but. This is possibly the most important election of my lifetime where everything hinges on... I I think it's probably the most important election or one of the most important in American history because it's going to ultimately determine whether or not, uh, from a political point of view, we can turn things around. And if we don't change what's gone on in the last eight years and what actually we've been seeing in the course of the past 50 years, then uh, I don't believe that we can turn it around. That, and this is a message I want to get out, especially to the millennial generation. So, out of all of the candidates, uh, who are you liking the best? Um, and to, to each of the candidates, 
what would you say they would have to do to get your vote? And um, how do you how do you think the uh, how do you think the future president, you know, if he or she is a Republican, needs to turn this country around? What, what would you advise them to do? All right, there's there's. Let me take the tack of like who I am personally for, but I'll start out with personally I am for Ted Cruz, and let me tell you why. I've listened to him debate extensively, and uh, Alan Dershowitz, a lawyer, uh, one of the constitutional uh, lawyers and professors that works out of Harvard, a liberal, not a conservative by any stretch of the imagination, he has come out, and I've uh, listened to him, saying that Ted Cruz, just from a debating point of view, can take on anybody who said look out. I think he could go up against either Hillary Clinton or Bernie Sanders, and mop the floor with them. I've heard him debate. I've heard him take on the media. Um, he is a strong constitutional conservative. When you listen to what he stands for, he really wants to return us to, more than anything else, to be a constitutional republic where our constitution is put above everything else, and reducing the size of the government, strong support for Israel, military, traditional things. Now, having said that, and this is going to probably anger a lot of people that are listening in on your show, regardless, whoever the Republican Party ends up nominating for our president, or for our candidate for the presidency, I will vote for that person, and I'm going to tell you why. We have quite a few people in the field, and any of them, in my personal and professional opinion, could defeat Hillary or Bernie, and I believe we would still be better off than we would be if either Hillary or Bernie were elected. I can't believe the Democrats have put up the two candidates that they have, an old man who's a socialist slash communist, and uh, another candidate in Hillary who is being investigated very seriously by the FBI and the Clinton Foundation and the horrific way that she handled Benghazi. And anybody listening that has gone out and seen 13 Hours, which is a truthful, and even liberals, uh, Kirsten Powers, a Democrat, uh, backs everything in there and how she could have dropped the ball in the way that she did, as well as President Obama. She is not fit, and Bernie Sanders is not fit to be the leader of our country. So I would put up any of the uh, candidates that uh, the party would put up and get behind it. And this is a message that I want to get out to people because I've argued with people uh, personally, you know, on Facebook and, and so forth. Here's the thing. We have something that we can go by, Sam, in recent history. In 2012, when Mitt Romney went up against Barack Obama, Mitt Romney had a golden opportunity to win the presidency, and he should have. Granted, he did not run the best campaign. Um, I don't believe he did, especially towards the end. He uh, dropped the ball. But here is why he lost and why Obama was reelected. There were millions, literally millions, of evangelical Christians, conservative Catholics and whatnot, that sat out that election because he was Mormon. Right. And because they did not show up at the polls, this is only four years ago, so, because they did not show up at the polls, or let me reword it another way, had they shown up at the polls, despite all the election fraud that the Democrats committed and so forth, had those people shown up and voted for Mitt Romney, we would have a different president right now in the White House. And our country, no matter what, would have fared much better between him and a Republican-controlled Senate and House of Representatives. But because people were so narrow-minded about that and stuck on a, either a particular char uh, character that they wanted or whatever, we don't always get our way in the nomination process. For example, I'll say I back Ted Cruz. It could very well be Marco Rubio. I have no problem with that. It could very well be Trump. I have no problem with that in the sense that, you know, any of these guys would be better. Even Jeb Bush. I've never been a fan of Jeb Bush. But if we don't quit this civil war and this divisive, bitter 
scene that I see going on between conservatives and the various supporters of these various candidates. And people continue to take the attitude that if my guy doesn't get the nomination or whatever, I'm not going to vote and take a fatalistic viewpoint of that, we're going to see a repeat of 2012. Mark my words. I'm, a six, I'm 60 years old and I've been voting since the 1960s. And I hope people are listening and I hope they take uh, heed in what I'm saying because I've heard all the arguments, the lesser of the two evils. It doesn't matter. Yep. Look what happened when Romney lost the election and what has transpired in four short years. Well, yeah, and I, and I agree with you. This this is actually one of the reasons I wanted to bring you on because John, I mean, folks, John and I are, are very good friends personally uh, off air. And one of the things that I have mentioned to you folks is the fact that politics is a game of chess. And right now, conservatives don't know how to play that game it, in in order to win we need to play that game and john and i have both brought up this point now okay i'm not the only one saying this anymore we need to back the candidate whoever he or she may be otherwise we will see a repeat of 2012 and it could be absolutely disastrous um yeah i mean i i think you're completely you're completely right yeah. And this is one thing I also posted on Facebook, Sam, if I could interject this. I sure. Said, you know, I'm going to give the devil his due, the Democrats. They know how to play this game much better than we do. It's a dirty game. Yeah. It's a rough game. And if you can't stand the heat, then get out of the kitchen. Because they know how to circle the wagons and come behind their candidates much better than the Republicans, the conservatives, and the libertarians do. Yeah. And well, that's so true. They will get behind and fight to the death for their candidate. And they'll have their George Soroses and the mainstream media and everybody coalesce with them uh, to get the job done. Whereas what we did in 2012 and what we're doing now is we're not playing the game the way it needs to be played. We're not going to always get our candidate that we would like to see get the nomination. I don't know who it's going to be, Sam. I really don't. Neither do but I. The point is, um, a lot of people are acting like a bunch of crybabies when you know their own candidate doesn't uh, get the nod. And no, you know we have to pull together. We have to do it for the sake of the country. It was like Reagan said. At I was, I don't think I think I might have been in sixth grade watching a convention. We watched the Democratic convention at that time. My mother was a Democrat. She was strong for uh, Hubert Humphrey and all of my family, uh, immediate family, converted to Republicans later. But in the 60s, they were Democrats. Both my mother and father were who were divorced. And I was watching the convention, uh, the Democrats, and uh, they really treated Hubert Humphrey poorly, and uh, which surprised both my mother and I. And then when we watched the opening of the Republican convention, Ronald Reagan himself, with a couple of others, stood up and on national TV said they were personally appalled at the way the Democrats had treated Hubert Humphrey. And he said he was always a man that never put party ahead of country. And my mother and I looked at each other, we raised our eyebrows, and we thought, hmm, you know, we hope everybody's listening to that. And we need, I, I could believe, any of our candidates could do a job of bringing us together or at least attempting under a conservative or at least, I don't know so much about conservative, but at least a Republican control of the House and Senate could get a lot done if we could get a president as well as a Republican-controlled Senate and House of Representatives that would basically take an approach that is, if you will excuse my expression, balls to the walls. You know, I mean, they've got to get in there right. and have to stand for something. That's why so many people are angry right now. And even Trump has tapped in very effectively in that anger, to his credit, because we elect people. They tell us what they want us to hear. They take control of the House and Senate, and then they don't govern according to the manner in which they were voted in uh, by us. And it is time for change. And we've got, we've really got to... 
you know, we've got to affect this change. Listeners, you've got, you've got to put aside your favorite person or the let, you know, not worry about the less, uh, lesser of two evils in the way that I'm seeing. I've never seen so much ugliness as I've seen in this particular cycle. It, it's, it's enough to make your hair stand on end. Y- yep. See the way the conservatives are going after each other. Conservatives and libertarians are going after each other. And uh, the way the candidates are going after each other, that, boy, what a role model they are right now. Yeah. You know, they feed into the news media that pits them against each other. Uh, to Christie's credit, he has consistently tried to bring focus back on who is our real opponent, Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders. And uh, while the rest of them go at it and criticize and name call and everything else, because all they're doing is playing into the media's... Um, you know, to get ratings and and so forth. We have got to unite, Sam, and if we don't, it's over. Pure and simple. I could I could not agree uh, with with you more. It's uh, it's quite scary. Uh, okay, John, where can where can we find you? Do you have a blog or a Twitter handle? Yes, sir. I have many uh, blogs on my personal website, um, and for those that it, it's all lowercase and all jammed together. Excuse my language <laughs> approach. I'm 60. Um, it's www.sissificationofamerica.com. www.sissificationofamerica.com. And uh, my book can be purchased um, on that website by ki- uh, uh, clicking on the Amazon banner. Yeah. Uh, there is a picture of the book, and um, it says preview to buy. You can uh, click on the picture of the book, and it will take you directly to the store on Amazon.com. Or uh, you can go to Amazon.com and type in the name of the book, my name, John W. Stevens, and you can purchase it either in print if you want the old-fashioned book in your hand, or you can get it on Kindle um, as well. And um, then also I have a lot of blogs that are interesting that I've I've written on a variety of uh, topics related to the book as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've checked out your blog, and I, folks, I really recommend you go uh, look at it. That's sissificationofamerica.com. And, uh, John, I, I want to thank you so much for uh, coming on the show today. And uh, oh, yeah. please, please feel free to come back anytime. So. Oh, I had a great time, and uh, I appreciate you bringing me on. And, uh I had a lot of fun, Sam, and I hope that my message reaches people and they may not all agree with me, but maybe it'll give them a little bit of food for thought. Yep, you and know. that's that's the intention here. All right, John, uh, God bless and have a great uh, rest of your weekend. So, Thank you, Sam. God bless you too. All right. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, that Take is... Take care. All right, you too. All right, ladies and gentlemen, and that concludes uh, our program for uh, tonight. I want to thank you all for uh, tuning in uh, to listen to both Michael and uh, John uh, from all of us here at NGC Studios. Have a good night. God bless and God save this great nation.